We are back. This is still Senate uh, Government Operations, and it is still Friday, February 25th, and most of the state is being hammered with snow, so if people are driving in their cars while they're testifying, I hope that you have your hands free because we would not want um, you to get in trouble. So we are going to go to, <coughs> excuse me, S250. And this might seem like a, a bizarre way of dealing with a bill. We have had a walkthrough of this bill. Um, ben has given us a walkthrough of the bill and I don't remember the date, but he did. And so it is, um, the issues in it are all related, but pretty, um, disparate, if that's what I want to say. So the, the what we've found in the past in dealing with um, bills that have a lot of kind of moving parts and a lot of things that aren't necessarily connected to the whole <coughs> is to, to divide them up and to take testimony on discrete sections of the bill so that we don't have to keep jumping back and forth. And that might seem odd to some of you who aren't used to dealing with this, but our committee has found that it's very helpful to do it that way so that we can take testimony on one section, decide if this is something we wanna go with, not go with, make changes, and then go on to the next section so that um, we don't have to keep jumping back and forth. So that is, so today <coughs> what we're looking at is sections three, four, and nine of, S250. Um, so I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, and, and, and we also, just for those of you who weren't with us when we did the, um, the initial walkthrough, section two is the whole section on qualified immunity. And as Ben knows, he's been dealing with that hours upon hours upon hours in the Judiciary Committee. So we're not going to take any testimony on that section at all because he's working really hard with the Judiciary Committee on, on that issue. And it, got, it was put in here, I assume, just in case Judiciary didn't take it up, there would be some vehicle for it. So um, that's, that's the way we're going to proceed here. And um, so we have on our list, again, a, quite a number of <coughs> people to testify. And I'm going to start with section three, which is found on page, um, uh, on page eight. Okay. Yes. At the top of page eight under um, section three. <clears throat> and I, any, anybody can weigh in on this section. I would like to hear, I guess, first from um, those most involved in training. And that would be, um, uh, I'm looking at my list here, Heather and, um, Chris, I don't know, Heather and Chris, how you're going to do this. <coughs> um, Eitan and Susanna, um, I think that that, but anybody, uh, anybody else can weigh in once we hear from those people, if that's okay. If, and committee, if you have any suggestions for doing this in a different manner, just let me know. So if we can start with section three, which would change the number of um, training um, around um, I'm on, around fair and partial um, policing policy from four to ten hours. So I would um, jump first, I believe, to Heather. So Heather, if you would like to join us. You, we can't hear you. So 
It's probably the snow. So maybe what we'll do is start with Chris until, and then may, maybe if you jump off and then come back in, it might clear it up. Okay, thanks. Okay, Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Christopher Burkell for the record, Deputy Director of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, I will be fairly brief in my comments relative specific to section three of the bill. And relative to the um, draft, which includes 10 hours of fair and impartial policing training um, as required by this section, which would be every odd number of years. And I think in conversation with uh, council staff trainers, the fair and impartial policing committee, um, RDAP, and um, Susanna Davis, who was also on the council, is that um, not speaking on their behalf, but having conversations with all of those folks is that I think that putting a number to uh, any type of training just as a number for, for hours is not necessarily the best option to go, but doesn't really give us what that content of that training is. And setting an hourly number doesn't allow us to actually involve the partners that we want to involve in fair and impartial policing. And you know we've had con uh, conversations already with RDAP about their input as well as using the um, equity impact assessment tool. And we wanna involve those types of tools in all of the training that we do here. So I believe that the 10 hours was more concerning to us than actually determining what is the best content for that training and delivering that and not just using a number. So that was the concern on, on the part of the council. And, I see Heather's back, so maybe she might have other comments to that. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. We still can't hear you. <clears throat> Are you over in Pittsburgh? Maybe that's the problem. Rutland is really being hammered. I'm the only one in Pittsburgh, but I, I, I believe um, Heather's comments that I'm getting from her that her audio is not working, that she doesn't believe that there's anything more that she wanted to add to that. Okay, so then what I think I will do is um, jump to uh, Eitan and Susanna to um, who are part, are part of the um, the helping to define the training and how it's how it's um implemented and how it's um what's the word i'm given that's not the word i want but anyway okay the curriculum the curriculum no 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 okay. how the training is done but it I'll doesn't make any it. difference a time no, execution X mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Execution. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, I, my, one of my main comments is to simply agree very strongly with um, Christopher and also, I guess, Heather about specifying the number of hours. I, I've spoken about this. I, I mean, I've spoken about this with Senator Ron Hinsdale as well. And we were, both talking about the need to increase the number of hours of training. I, I am fully in agreement with that, but I also think that naming it and saying 10 is, I say as an educator, that's kind of iffy. Um, I do some of this training um, at the academy and it, it <laughs> There are days when, you know, I'm given six hours and at five, we're really done. Um, there are days where we go have six hours and we don't have enough time. Um, it just seems best to sort of say something to the, I would say as a suggestion um, that maybe the, the, uh, 
the fo there should be a focus upon in increasing, I don't know, intensity and amount of training around matters of fair and impartial policing. And I would leave it there um, and just say that that, that ought to fit. Um, one of the things I want, I, I don't think we need to go into, I had a whole, I don't know who I thought I was talking to. I thought I was apparently speaking with people who um, wouldn't think that we should do this, that there shouldn't be more training. So I have all these notes here that I'm looking at now that are completely useless. So let me simply point out um, that th now that we have an expanded criminal justice council, um, that that matter of training should be left to that body, the amount of it, and it's to it's also to its attendance subcommittees. Um, and again, I guess the language of the bill should say something about increasing the focus upon FIP, but leaving the substance and structure of that training to the academy and to the council and other stakeholders. Vagueness in this instance, I think can be a handmaiden to appropriate this. So that would be my suggestion. Now, the one other thing that I do want to add here, and I hate to be Eeyore, even though that's been my nickname for years, but um, as Eeyore, I have to say there are a couple problems here, and that isn't anything that we really can blame on anyone. Um, there are so few sworn members at this moment that putting in extra training now, new training, I should say, is difficult. And I say that as someone who is a completely true believer in training and education and certainly around fair and impartial policing matters. Um, but the problem is that we do, there are, we're facing unprecedented staffing challenges and it's very much impossible to pull people from public safety duties to intensely train about how to perform those self-same duties. Um, it literally is a matter of taking people off the road in order to do this. And there are some problems with that. Um, I did not understand that initially. I have come to understand it. I had developed a really, now I'm gonna toot my own horn, really exciting and brilliant training for the advanced trooper school on the matter of fair and impartial policing eight months after they had completed their training and had been on the road. Um, we were not able to do it when it was originally scheduled precisely because we couldn't take 10 people off the road at the same time. There was a question of coverage. There was a question of staffing. So in the end, a balance must be struck between what would be desirable and in some ways necessary, and what is possible, um, that's reality, and wishing isn't gonna accomplish very much. I can tell you that VSP is working both on recruitment and retention, um, but not enough has moved in regard to these challenges of which I speak to allow for what would be absolutely the best. And I think that's really all I need to say to you. I know you've got a lot of people lined up, um, and, you need to hear from them. Thank you. I'm gonna make a suggestion here that um, I am looking at my notes from last time and um, Susanna made the comment that it should be embedded in all aspects of training. And we might change this to say something like on or before all law enforcement officers shall receive training as required by this section that is embedded in all aspects of training. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I just throw that out as a, a comment. Yes, Senator Ram Hinsdale. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree. So, I mean, I think Aton will appreciate this section was specifically in response to concerns he raised about not having enough time. <laughs> and, you know, I think there's always a compromise, whether it's on hours or content or you know, whatever the case may be. I think that the concern I have the most, and I've heard it echoed from other folks in law enforcement is pedagogy, is that there are often times when they are doing an online training, it's, it's non-interactive, um, 
you know, the, the whole point of this is to learn out loud. I think you can't really understand your own partiality and your own biases unless you're learning out loud and asking questions that you feel safe asking that change your assumptions and change the way you think. And I have heard from law enforcement themselves that they have experienced, if it's the truth, it's, it's ongoing, like, you know, online modules. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm concerned about that pedagogy because I don't think it helps mm -hmm. someone with split, split second decisions or changing how they interact with people. Yes, um, uh, thank you. And Eitan, did you have a response to that? And then I'm gonna jump to- No, I, I just, clarification. I just wanted to make, Senator, you, you're talking about that the online stuff doesn't do what the in-person stuff is doing. No, I, making... I, I, I think the only thing I'm wedded to is that pedagogy is so important in you know things around diversity and equity, not necessarily the number of hours. But if you had two hours of a deep conversation versus two hours of sitting online and looking at something, that's going to be really different. Preaching to the choir. Preaching to the choir. <laughs> So I'm going to jump to Susanna. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't actually have much to add here. I'm also a little bit ambivalent about the change in the number of hours. We know that it's an, uh, an issue of quality, not quantity. We've heard many times that people like the officer who murdered George Floyd in 2020 had completed 40 hours of crisis intervention training in 2016. And did a, a use of force training in 2018, right? So it's not necessarily about logging the correct number of hours, but rather about making sure that it is quality instruction and that it's being utilized and reinforced and that it becomes so deeply embedded in everything that we do that you can't forget what you learned in the classroom because it's part of the day-to-day -day work. And so if we can find ways to, um, to thread fairness and impartiality through all of the work, then effectively, the full workday becomes the training every day. So, so the language that I suggested, does that may help at all or does that just muddle it up even more? I think it does help. I think it does help. And um, I would be very curious and very eager to participate in figuring out who and how we make sure it, it what, to make sure who are the people determining what embedded means. Okay. And what are the anchor, what are the benchmarks that we're using to determine that? That may be a process that's already existing and I don't know about it, but if it is not, then I would um, be very eager to volunteer to participate in helping to shape what does it mean for, for it to be embedded. So maybe, maybe it's best to just leave it like not change it at all right now and just leave it as it is and have you or and Eitan working with the um with the training with the criminal justice council training to make sure that that happens no instead of that. trying to be prescriptive here okay yes i would Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else want to weigh in on this particular section? Um, Dan? Thank you, Madam Chair. Dan Fingus, Rights and Democracy. Um, I just want to make sure uh, embedding it obviously is the right way to go and it makes total sense, but I think a tracking mechanism and making sure that it's really clear that Departments aren't just saying that they're embedding it and then it's just like, oh, it's in everything. So we don't actually have to list the ways that it's actually embedded and making sure that it's actually still being able to be tracked. And that way, if a department or an officer does have a complaint, we can actually look back at the record and see if they are doing the embedding properly, if they if there are things that they haven't done. So I think just making sure there's a mechanism for tracking would be really crucial to that. Yeah, and I, I think that we could... Um, <clears throat> I'm going to suggest that we can probably leave that detail up to Eitan and Susanna to make sure that they, but you're right. Thank you, Dan. That's a you. good observation. Yes, Senator Ron Hinsdale. So I just so appreciate Eitan and Susanna. And I think so often if things aren't written down, then it's really up to them to keep pushing and 
you know, <laughs> say, remember we had this conversation. Um, I just think, you know, they can't be their own accountability mechanisms. Um, so, you know, I don't know if it's like, it, there is something about tracking best practices, reporting back how, like modules and how this is being implemented and modified, you know, but it, it so often happens that people of color end up having to be their own, you know, drivers of this change. And I would hate to see that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I think we have to put some faith in the Criminal Justice Council to to divide to come up with the system and figure out how to do the tracking of it because I I certainly don't want to put language in here that tells them how to track. Um, I don't know if that um, it's Aton, Susanna, Heather, Christopher, anybody want to. Well, I was just going to remark that we, I think that I, Senator Rom Hinsdale so right. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know how to like say how right she is, but she's so right. Um, but I also think that we have the Criminal Justice Council. We have the entire academy. Um, I think that there's a body of people here who are still to some degree untested because it's new, it's all new yet. Um, and I think that the accountability, there's, there's a lot of it there. Um, there's a lot of it there. And I think that we simply all have to be aware that we need to do that with one another. Great. Okay, thank you. So um, committee, are we okay that we won't change this section now and, um, and next year, if any of us are back, we will ask for a report to come back um, on how the training is going and how they're accounting for the um, training as it's embedded, if any of us are back. Or we'll leave a note for whoever is back on the desk. Okay. All right, so can we jump to section four, which is, um, data collection and I suspect that um, I'm going to ask first for Jeff Wallens because I think that's where no, there you are um, to to just walk us through how we do it what this um, section four means. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, meet with the committee today and provide a little bit of perspective what I can for the record. My name is Jeffrey Wall and I'm the director of the Vermont Crime Information Center. Currently, VCIC is, is responsible for the tracking of uh, criminal incident data from arrest, arraignment, and conviction. And generally that's understood in the most, most common language for that is the rap sheet. You know, that's really what that's understood to be. And so that's the data that we provide and we make available to authorized individuals for authorized purposes. Um, for data elements such as a, and I'm gonna use the term use of force, uh, which is common in the national discussion right now, those aren't inherently part of a criminal history record because they may or may not ultimately lead to any kind of criminal charge, et cetera. Um, if they do, then that information then becomes part of the individual's criminal history record. But we don't currently um, at the VCIC level track this type, of this type of data. It may be something that individual agencies track themselves and they may use something like the Valcor records management system to do that. And if agencies were interested in standing up a statewide collection or analysis tool, uh, particularly as it might interface with the federal use of force program, we would certainly be willing to partner with um, them on that. But we do not currently track um, anything in a centralized manner here at VCIC with regards to uh, incidents that may or may not lead to criminal charges. Okay, well, that was pretty clear. Um, so I think then, does anybody have any questions for Jeff or should we jump to commissioner to find out 
Oh, I don't, I think he's gone away. Um, yes, Senator Rom Hinsdale, so that we can find out how, how currently the, the information is collected and where it's kept. Yeah, I mean, I guess my question is, but you could, right? Like there's nothing, if, if that was, if it was a directive, you could collect that information and you could have demographic information about people who might have been the recipient of that force. Uh, well, we typically currently, I wanna be careful here because certainly anything is possible uh, you know, with data collection efforts. The question is where is the best place for that information to start? We certainly don't collect information on victims or anything of that nature. Um, so we don't really have any kind of mechanism to track or collect or house that type of data. Um, again, I would think that likely the role for VCIC, uh, the Vermont Crime Information Center, excuse me, uh, for uh, anything of this nature would be to uh, provide some assistance and expertise on agencies on how to uh, gather that data uh, and to leverage systems they may already be using um, and then how to interface those in a, in a collective manner. But I would be somewhat concerned about us standing up a brand new data collection effort um, which is not really related or adjacent to anything we're currently doing. Okay. So I think that maybe we lost the commissioner. I was hoping that he could tell us how this data is currently collected. I know that one of the, one of the things that has recently happened is that every all the law enforcement agencies, I believe are now using Valcor. So they at least are using the same the same system, but does anybody else um, care to weigh in on this uh, section on, and, and the, even if you don't know exactly how we do it currently, if you'd like to just weigh in on, on what, what is being proposed here, that, that would be um, good. If anybody um, looking around to see who unmutes themselves, <laughs> Falco? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so for, sure. for the record, Falco Schilling, advocacy director for the ACLU of Vermont. And <clears throat> I just wanna say overall, as we look at this bill, I know we are not looking at all the sections, but just we're very supportive of this legislation and the intent behind all the different sections, but speaking specifically to the data collection piece, this is something that we'd be supportive of. I mean, if there's details to be worked out, um, we would be happy to know more about those, but having more information about how law enforcement is conducted in our state is essential. We've seen uh, recently, especially in the, the correction system, how essential that has been as we've gone through the Justice Reinvestment Project. And as we have better information about how we conduct um, you know, law enforcement throughout the state, we can make better assessments of what changes might need to be made, what policies put in place are being effective, and um, how those policies are, are working, um, especially we've seen from this traffic stop data that since it's been collected, we've been able to see um, bias in, uh, in these traffic stops across the state. We've been able to then work to try and address them, um, especially being able to go um, look department by department. And um, you, know, you, you can't address problems until you know they're there. So just we'll quickly say we are in support of this language and in this section and of more data collection in general and making that available um, to decision makers and the public to have a better understanding of how um, their government and those tasked with uh, promoting their public safety are operating. So those are our comments on this. Section. Thank you. I, I do have a couple questions and I, I don't know where to direct them, I guess, because I, <clears throat> I, I do know that we need to have some consistent data and that we need to have data collected and that we need to then we need to collect the data and measure what it is we want want to know um, not just collect data for the sake of collecting the data but so that we can measure what it is we want to and then how how we use the data once it's collected and and who who has access to it but i the on uh, Fortunately, I'm not sure how to go forward here now because the devil is in the detail and I, we need to know if this is the way we want to do it or not. I, do, I just do have a, 
question, for example, um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure how it works. So I don't know what I'm asking here is on the first part of it, it says that they shall collect data concerning roadside stops and law enforcement encounters resulting in officer involved death or seriously bodily, serious bodily injury. And then this is what should be collected, but we don't know if there's an incident involving death or serious bodily injury until after it happens. So then we can't collect the data. So are we saying that in every instance, whether or not there's death or serious bodily injury, this is the data that should be collected in, in every stop or every encounter? So, because how can you collect it afterwards? I, I don't know. So that I'm just asking these questions about how this would work. I, I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of paperwork to do if there's death or serious bodily injury as a result of an interaction with an officer. So I guess like them not knowing, just struggling with that. But I understand we don't have law enforcement here to talk about what happens now. I just can't imagine that they don't have to keep some paperwork on hand from that kind of incident. And they're already supposed to be routinely collecting demographic information from a visual and, you know, approximate assessment. Yeah, and, and I, I get that. My, I, I just wonder is if we're already collecting all the data, why do we need to specify that they need this data if there's an incident involving that? I mean, I don't know if they collect age, gender, and race of the driver on all. All, in, in all instances, they're supposed to. On all, in all instances of wouldn't encounters. have to stop data if they did. No, no, no. I'm not talking about just traffic's. Oh, this is just traffic stops. No, this is all law enforcement encounters. Okay, so this yes, is, this I is mean, the whole. We wouldn't, wouldn't have data if they didn't collect that information. So then, you couldn't collect it after the fact. I mean, I guess that's the concern I have is how how this actually would work. Are we gonna, are we saying that we should collect all of this data for every encounter just in case there's, uh, I, I, because you can't, if there's an incident that you couldn't have anticipated when the traffic stop was made or the encounter happened but you weren't, you were, you didn't collect the data because you didn't know there was going to be an incident. Then how do you go back and collect the data afterwards? That I guess those are some of the questions that I have about the way. And maybe Ben, maybe Ben has some knowledge of how this works. Well, uh, hi, uh, Madam Chair, Ben Novogrosky from the Office of Legislative Council. I don't have direct knowledge of. The procedures that that occur when there is a, an encounter, but just as a point of clarity, um, the the first part of this section is already in existence um, in law. Uh, what is E subdivision one A? Um, this was just changed um, really for um, the the designations of it, but it's new subdivision B, and this is just the law enforcement counters where death or serious bodily injury occurs. So it's not all law enforcement in encounters. Um, so just as a point of clarity there. Um, but, you know, I think that that question would, would probably be better directed at um, someone that works at a law enforcement agency or a DPS. Okay. Yeah, that, I guess that's my concern is if, if we're already collecting it uh, at every roadside stop, then that I understand that we are. But I doubt that we're collecting that at every encounter. And you don't know if there's going to be an incident when the initial encounter is made. So you don't, you don't go to a, a, a domestic violence and get everybody's age and gender and race um, and record it. And yet there could be. Um, 
a serious um, incident here that results in death or bo serious bodily injury, but you haven't collected the data first. So how do you go back and collect the data afterwards? I, that, those, those are my questions, not questioning whether we need the data, but how, how it actually works in um, real life. So I guess maybe since we have no one here to address that. I, I can chime in quickly okay. and hopefully try and help clarify. And if, if I, there's any misstatements here, I hope someone will correct the record afterwards. Okay. But I believe that as part of the new use of force law that was passed and then the rules and policies that were implemented along with that, that there is reporting on use of force incidents. So um, anytime that the force is being used, I believe that there's data being recorded about that. And so um, I would imagine that if there is an encounter where a death or serious bodily injury is resulting, there would be some sort of force being used. And I think there's already some form of reporting requirement for that, but um, I will let someone else who's more directly involved um, speak to that, but I think that this is something where they might already be collecting some of this data and this might be um, adding on top of that, but I- oh, Okay, thank you, that, that helps. But I have one more question for Ben. If C, if A is already, or C, e, no, that's an E. E1 is already set in the language. We haven't added anything there, right? Correct. Okay. And it does say law enforcement encounters resulting in officer involved death or serious bodily injury. Why do we need B? Because it just repeats the same thing. Well, and ju just to clarify, so that that portion, law enforcement encounters resulting in officer involved death, that is a new addition. It, I know. Before, before it was just roadside stop data that was being collected. But in, in line... 15 on page eight, it says, and law enforcement encounters. It doesn't, it isn't limited to roadside stops. And then in B, the whole thing is repeated. Well, so that was, that's really just the, the, the construct. So it's, it's adding that in E and then in subdivision B of uh, subsection E1, it's listing the type of information that would be collected in uh, a law enforcement encounter involving death or serious bodily injury, which is not currently in the statute. No, I'm, I I'm, don't I'm think sorry I'm if I'm not understanding. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not being clear here. So E1 says in all roadside stops and in all law enforcement encounters that result in uh, death or serious bodily injury, right? But it's it, not, okay, so not just roadside stops. That's It just, says, it, it, right, it says on line 15, roadside stops and law enforcement encounters. So that's, that's there, that's, it's already covered. All law enforcement encounters that result in death or serious bodily injury are covered now in E1A. So why do we need B? Because they're, it's just repeating what's in A. Am I wrong about that? We're, we're talking on page nine, um, lines five through eight. Um, yes, okay. it, it beginning on f line five and going through line eight. No, on uh, page 10, I, I mean, page nine. Yeah. Are there on B? On B, on line 10, it simply repeats everything that's in A. I don't- And I don't understand why we need that. I don't see where B is. So oh, B is on page 10 on line four. Correct. Oh, uh, well, I have a different, I have a different um, version then. It is, if you look at section four, there's E1A. Right. Yep. And there's a and E1A covers all traffic stops and all law enforcement encounters that result in. Correct. Then if you Correct. go on and it lists um, a, a for a bunch of things, then if you go on to B, it, it repeats exactly what is right. in. But 
it it's for law enforcement encounters versus roadside stuff. No, no let go back, please go back to E1. Yeah, and it, it says, says both there. You're right. It says both. So why do no. we need to repeat it in B? Sure. That's you know, I think that's you're right. my question. They're all the same. It that's does my say question. Yeah, that's a good that's question. My, that's my question. Why do we need to repeat it if it's already covered there? Well, it, it could be consolidated so it's 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 drafted so it's more concise. Uh, the, the difference where is, is just the roadside stop data it's referencing the driver as opposed to the decedent or the injured oh, right. person. So there is that small change, but that could be changed you know, through drafting. It doesn't have to remain that way if it would be clearer in a way. So you oh, you're saying because in there it says uh, driver and in the other one it says injured person. That's the difference. Correct. Okay. Okay. I'm okay then. It, it just uh, seemed repetitive. silly to me to have to repeat the whole thing, but there is slight difference and it's probably easier to separate it. But yeah, I would take out law enforcement encounters in the first one then because anyway, it doesn't have anything to do oh. with roadside stops or drivers. But it, it just sets up the whole section that it's going to address both those things. I think. No. Okay. Yeah, that was anyway. the, the intent yep. behind the drafting right. is that it just sort of sets the stage. And then the one section, the subdivision A covers roadside stop data, subdivision B covers okay. law enforcement encounters. Sorry to be so dense. No, no, it's. No, I'm. I'm I'm, okay. I'm pretty much okay with all those collecting all that data. I think we do need to have some information about how we use that um, data to help set policy or, um, and I don't know if we need something in here about that or not. About how it's shared with us? No, not how it's, um, I guess just some kind of a, um, it always, um, I always think of that we don't want to just collect data, that we want to be able, and how is the data to be used? And I, I, in helping both us to set policy and law enforcement to do their training. And so well, I don't and know. It should if, be publicly available so that the public can hold them accountable. So that's. Is that a question for Jeff? Is how that how's that data analyzed and how's it been applied? They don't collect this data. If you remember what Jeff said, he collects data on criminal um, records, not on incidents. This is not necessarily criminal, but um, I thought VCIC was held all the records no he just testified that he didn't yeah, no, I, I i heard but i i thought for some unknown reason that like public records that they had all the criminal records and reports but these aren't necessarily criminal records right they're uh, just madam the madam chair I'm, uh, sorry to interrupt mike Sherling from public safety oh. just letting you know that i'm on now a staff member uh sent me a note <laughs> i and i think we got i think i got my questions answered. Um, I, I don't know if we need more. Um, I'm a little bit torn here about what and I'm, I apologize for taking all that time to just because I'm so apparently so dense. Um, no, you're not so dense. There's nothing dense about you. The qu the qu the this is all kept in Valcor, right? I mean, so Valcor is aggregating all this data that as the as each department in, uh, reports it after an incident after an encounter after a roadside stop and it, it it who who oversees the valcor data so uh a couple of fragments from just the last uh, two minutes that i've been able to hear um uh senator clarkson you are correct bcic maintains criminal history information which consists of 
records of criminal charges, convictions, and, uh, and outcomes, but only things that result from criminal charges. Uh, the computer-aided dispatch and records management system, which is named Valcor, uh, maintains the records of all uh, law enforcement responses, encounters, uh, reports, things of that nature for all but two agencies in Vermont. There are two who have opted not to use that, that statewide system. Um, not knowing exactly what fields of data you're talking uh, uh, about, I don't have um, any additional context to say um, what's collected relative to the discussion. Um, but my sense is there's probably an intersection with use of force here. And I can report at the moment that of the 73 agencies on Valcor, uh, there are at least 14 who are using some alternate mechanism to track use of force. So I would, um, I'm gonna um, take a poll here of what we wanna do. I would, because I think there's, we need to um, spend more time on this. I think that there, uh, Senator Ram Hinsdale suggested that this should all be public information so that people can be held accountable. I'm not sure that um, the, uh, we're doing a lot of identifying of the victim here and the driver. And I'm not sure if all that information wants to be public. It, it, um, it, it should be uh, the it age, race, and gender of the, of the victim. Um, I, I'm not sure that we that that is, but we, we need to have this further conversation, I believe. And it's almost 4.30 on Friday afternoon. And we haven't heard from people on this section yet. Um, and we yeah. haven't even gotten to section nine, which yeah. is the false confessions or confessions based on um, false information. Um, so what I'm gonna do is uh, suggest that we might, um, want to look at 155 and that we come back. Um, if we have 155 off our plate, we can devote the um, a substantial block of time to 250 and address this and the remaining um, sections. Is that, does that make, is that okay to everybody? I mean, I'm, I'm willing to stay here, but um, I, I have think. a 430. So it would okay. be, I'd love to do 155 and come back to this because I think we have to figure out. Yeah, I think there are a lot of questions that we have to answer in this. And then we can make, I, then I can make sure that we get the appropriate people in here, like, and maybe um, somebody can think about um, drafting something around. Um, and I, I believe that this was one of the things that when we were talking before with um, Susanna Davis about collection of data was, um, and also with Aton about how, why we collect the data, how, what are we trying to measure and how do we use the, the data? Right. And, and so that we could, if, if we can incorporate, um, if there are already policies out there around then that, then that's fine. But if there aren't, then how do we maybe incorporate that into here? Yeah. Oh, I mean, um, I was fixing my hair, but I, oh. you know, <laughs> I absolutely err on the side of data liberation and making it publicly available. I mean, I think as we start, as Falco mentioned and others, we have made the grave mistake of thinking we don't have issues in Vermont because we haven't been collecting certain pieces of data and making them publicly available. And there are, as we've learned over the course of hearing Aton's report and others, some really devastating disparities. I mean, almost as many black kids are arrested as white kids in Burlington, even though they show up nowhere near that amount of the population. Kid, black young men are represented 10 times more than their, their percent of the population in those charged as youth offenders in Chittenden County. So, you know, I, we have learned some things that are so, so dramatic and people have a right to know that. So that matches their 
feeling of what they're experiencing and their ability to have true participation in their democracy. Yeah, I, I, I agree that there is that aspect, but I still want to ha have more conversation around what, what is public and what isn't. I mean, we just passed a bill that said that um, arresting agencies can't release the names of youth um, and um, yeah. or any identifying information. And, and I, so I questioned somewhat about why, and anyway, I think we need to have this conversation more. So we will schedule this for um, kind of initially, Gail and I have been trying to work on a schedule and it is really hard to do because of the uh, next week's schedule, but I think that we- Madam Chair? Yes. It's currently scheduled for, let's see, Wednesday, March 9th at 3.15. Oh, okay. And I have sent out invitations. So oh. I think everybody on this call has probably gotten an invitation. Okay, great. Okay, I guess we have a date. So, great. all right, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, Madam Chair, just one question. So before um, this, it seems like with Section 3 that the committee indicated that there was no change to the law that needed to be made. Should I just strike that um, and I could circulate a new draft before the next meeting? You can if you want, but if that's the only change, I don't think I would um, bother doing that until we go through the other changes and okay. additions and stuff. So thank and, you, Ben. And, and I think as Madam Chair, if I could, uh, I think it would be great to have a chart of, of what data we do collect, where we collect it, when it's, what aspects of it are released. I mean, Ben, if you could do a, a chart of, of, the cha of the changes and, and some of, I think that would help us uh, as we deliberate in the week we come back on this. Do, do you see what I mean? I, it would be great to sort of have a one place where we have all of what we collect, who it's, who gets it, how, you know, what are the rules around its release um, and how are we using it currently? I mean, because I was thinking as we were having this conversation that of course the council also has data because it, 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 it does, it, it, it has data on officers that are, are, are being, uh, well, I can't think of the right word, but reprimanded is the, what I'm thinking of or, I mean, there's there's a lot of data that we have around law enforcement that I just love to know how you know as we go into this conversation how it's collected, where it's collected, where it's housed, when it's released. I, I think that would be helpful. How it's used in, currently. I we can probably do that. That's a pretty broad um, is, broad oh. request here. But I see Mike Sherling has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just briefly for uh, committee consideration as you uh, go away for the break and ruminate on this, uh, I've not seen anything in the draft that outlines any piece of data that isn't already collected yeah. and isn't already publicly available in some form or another. And going back two decades, uh, we've worked with the U.S. Department of Justice on uh, illuminating disparities in youth contact with the justice system. There have been a number of reports that have been done and made publicly available and have been written about uh, in, uh, uh, in the media. The media consistently requests reports out of our uh, computer-aided dispatch and records management system about um, types of contact, types of use of force. Um, there, there's a host of things um, right. that have been illuminated over the years. And just to remind the committee where we're going with the new system that is just th two months old now um, is to create public facing dashboards and uh, publicly available raw data for researchers to, uh, to look at. It's gonna take some time to get those things uh, stood up because they're, they're the next uh, iteration, next evolution of uh, the system and our, our data dissemination efforts, but they are part and parcel of what we view as transparency, which 
historically has been the ability to query and look at reports about what government does um, right. and less so about having um, this uh, robust data sets available. So these are all things that are in, in motion now and, um, and have been for a, a really long time. So I would encourage you to, uh, right. uh, to really get in the, the weeds can on you, what is you, available rather than. Can you email that data to the committee today? Or, or the data? There, there's a website that you I, can go I, to, to web website. it up. Uh, Senator, I, I can't email you a, 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 a multi-million line uh, data set. What I'm saying is the ability to query data and create reports like those that you're interested in exists um, and is done on a regular basis in response to a whole bunch of different things, whether it's research, occasionally legislative inquiries, media inquiries. Um, it is a, it's, a, it's a normal part of day-to-day -day business in government in general, but in and policing more specifically. So I would suggest that um, we do some more research on our own and then we come back on the ninth and we will um, look at this more and see what if, what if anything there is that we need to do. And I think that we'll make sure that we have the commissioner and Aton, I know that you, your committee and I get the, uh, initials wrong. It's R P A D. It, the, the, I got the initials right. I just didn't get them in the right order. No, no. Actually, it was the reverse. It's R D A P. Yeah, I knew I R got them yes. them right, but not in the right order. So, right. and could because you're involved in collection of data and reporting and stuff. Right. So we'll make sure that um, you're um, with us and everybody else who who wants to come and um, we'll send the invitation again to all the people that were on the list for today um, to make sure. And I did send, I know that um, Mark, he said they weren't gonna weigh in on this today, but I did send, tell him that we would be taking it up next Wednesday and he would be welcome to attend. So, Not next Wednesday, but- I mean, the, yeah, when we come back, thank you. Okay, so. I'm gonna suggest that we once again jump our topic here. And I see Amarin is with us and has a new draft. And thank you to everybody. Um, and we're going to 155, back to 155. Okay. Okay, do you have draft 2.1 either posted or in your email? It's yes. post, Gail has posted it. Excellent. All right, so I will skip down just to the changed sections. The first one is on page two, changing the name to the Office of Community Collaboration and Empowerment. And then the next page is down on page four, once again, correcting the name to Office of Community Collaboration and Empowerment. Next, change I believe is down in the full discussion of the office which begins on page 11 I believe yeah uh, bottom of page 10 into page 11 mm -hmm. section 5284 office of community collaboration and empowerment subsection a creation the office of community collaboration and empowerment is created within the agency Subsection B, duties, responsibilities. The Office of Community Collaboration and Empowerment shall. The first three are the, uh, the duties that were already in this bill. Uh, four, five, and six are the new. Subdivision four, create a system to periodically review all agency policies. That includes the use of uh, the equity impact assessment tool. Subdivision five, define the relationship between the Office of Community Collaboration and Empowerment and the other offices, divisions, and departments within the agency. And six, establish organizational structures that allow for meaningful community participation. Um, any questions on those before I move into the, the last language here? No. 
Uh, subsection C is the report section on or before November 1st, 2023, and every two years thereafter, the Office of Community Collaboration and Empowerment shall report to the House and Senate committees on government operations and on judiciary, and to the list of stakeholders identified pursuant to subdivision three of subsection B on the office's progress and implementation of the duties and responsibilities identified in subsection B of this section. The only uh, comment I have is it says every two years. And I think the what I had thought was that it would be annually for two years. So it isn't every two years they oh. report. It's that for the next two years, they have nice. to report. I see. Okay. So they would file a report on 23, 24, and 25. Okay. I should be able to fix that pretty easily. Did, did it, other, did everybody else understand it that way? Yes, yeah. just to get a, as we start it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I apologize. No, we were oh. a little scattered. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to go off camera and fix that and then I'll be right back. Okay, great. Oh, great. Other than that, does anybody have any issues? Nope. Um, There's a hand up. Yep, Commissioner Sherling, is that your that's a, that's old, old hand, hand or a new hand? I'm old and it's an old hand. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did get a note from Senator Polina who even though he isn't here said that he was okay voting for this bill. Maybe. But I think it'll still go one. down as, as 01. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it will be. It, he won't vote, but he was, he was prepared to vote for it. He could always come back online. Oh, I don't want to interrupt his. No, he may actually need that moment to escape. <laughs> No, by the time we get a hold of him and he answers his phone and maybe he's having a wonderful romp with his grandchildren and, you know, we don't want to bother him. And here's okay. Amron back again. I'm back. Um, may I screen share? Yes, sure. please. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I've changed <clears throat> the timing to read on or before November 1st, 2023 and annually for the two years thereafter. Yep. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. So this will then become uh, draft number 3.1. 3.1. Yep. Okay. Yes, Senator Colomar. I'm ready to move. Okay. I would move that the committee vote out draft the, the amendment to S-155 contained in draft 3.1. Cause it is a strike off. Yeah. So are we ready to vote? Yeah. I will say that, I will say that um, this bill has gone through a lot in the over the past four years and it has constantly been made a stronger bill because of input from people so i i think that um we're we're at a, a good point i hope others agree yep i do and once again your vision for this has helped steer it in that direction Okay, are we ready for the vote? Well, I'll just say that I would, I still have a lot of concerns that not about what is in the bill, but what's not in the bill after a major reckoning around racial justice and policing in this country. I think it could have been a more visionary proposal and bill. I think the way the public was engaged, we heard was not 
as meaningful as a lot of people wanted it to be. Um, I would rather know that pieces of S250 will pass first because I believe that to have an office of collaboration and empowerment, you really need to have data. You need to have strong policing mechanisms in place. You need to have measures of accountability and you need to listen to people. Um, but I am going to vote for this bill in the good faith that we will continue to take up S250 and deliver meaningful reforms that make a difference to people around how they engage with law enforcement and their own sense of community safety. Thank you. And I think that it isn't just S250. I think it's ongoing and that there are other, other bills and other reports that we need to um, look at when we come back um, to continue. And I keep going back to 124. I don't remember what the act is, but S124, which was this kind of a comprehensive um, bill that did a lot of things, including changing the Criminal Justice Council and a, the um, disciplinary procedures and decertification procedures. And so I think that we need to, we need to right. continue our work. I um, just don't want to forget that, you know, the only black woman who testified today said that that process failed her. And that unless these, we check on our legislation and make sure it's actually working for the people who are most impacted, who it's intended for, then we are patting ourselves on the back without making a true difference for people. Yep, you are right. We want to make a true difference for people. Okay. You're right. Are we ready for the vote? Yes. Senator Clarkson. Yes. Senator Collimore. Yes. Myself, Senator Rumpensdale. Yes. Senator White. Yes. And Senator Polina is absent. So that's a vote of four zero one. I further move that we vote out draft 3.1 of S-155 as amended. Senator Clarkson. Yes. Senator Collimore. Yes. Senator Rumpensdale. Yes. Senator Polina is absent. Senator White. Yes, thank you. 401. 401. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Amarin, for all your work on this. I know that you've been working on this for the entire time you've been in the Legislative Council. So. You're welcome. Um, and thanks to everybody who weighed in on this and. Um, we will continue our work. This is not the end. We will continue continue our work and continue to, and I don't want to say change the culture and the policing in Vermont. I want to say continue to work toward um, ever, ever improving. It's that it wasn't in terrible shape before. And I, I do need to make that clear that we, we will continue to work on it, but we're not, it isn't um, that it was so bad before that. Um, anyway, I don't, never mind. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I will report this. Oh, I think you should. Unless somebody else is dying to report it. We, I don't see anybody don't jumping anyone anyone down. <laughs> okay. So committee, I think that's it. And um, I would say as we come back uh, in a week that if they're, we're gonna try and <coughs> finish up all the things that we um, the things that we have le left over. And um, if people have, um, if, if any of you have people that are interested in testifying, because we have to figure out that finish the ethics, we have to deal, address 250. Um, so on any of the bills that are left, if you have people that want to testify, please let me know. Yes, and I'm uh, trying to get Pearson 
in case you want Treasure, Pierce, and uh, Tom uh, Galanka and any others to, together to move the, uh, that bill forward, uh, the divestment bill. So I know that's my homework for the week. Right? Yeah, because I think if we don't have um, suggested language yeah. by Tuesday that... Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I know, but I think we have to... Yeah, no, I, I, it's also... I, I, anyway. We'll find out who's available, who can work, and what we're what okay. we're doing. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I'm. Thanks. Have a great, have a lovely, week off. Re restoring week. Yeah.